should say to welcome back Greg Duncan, who um, has spent um, a good part of his life here at Michigan. Um, Greg is the Edwina S. Terry Professor at the School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University and um, is also a faculty fellow at the Institute for Policy Research. I had the pleasure of being Greg's colleague for at least a few years at Northwestern and um, I can tell you there's not a better colleague around. Um, Greg is an incredibly productive person. He has, um, um, in addition to the book he's talking about today, um, produced together with Lindsay Chase Lansdale, the book For Better and For Worse, Welfare Reform and the Well-Being of Children and Families, a book that those of us who um, you know, are interested in the overlap between sort of child development and public policy consult often. Um, he's produced the book The Consequences of Growing Up Poor, another book that is frequently produced by people in my area of study, frequently consulted, as well as the two-volume Neighborhood, po um, Neighborhood Poverty. Um, Greg is an economist by training from here at the University of Michigan, but has spent a great deal of time co-publishing and working with people who are much more in sort of the um, social psych area and the child development area. And he's really unique in terms of bringing both the tools and perspectives of economics together with the understanding um, uh, of some of the more developmental literature. And that's, that's a very unusual trait and it's one reason I think why he's had the impact um, that, that he really has had. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is the incoming president of the Population Association of America, or um, recently elected. I don't know quite when you, when you get uh, inaugurated into that position. Um, it's just absolutely great to welcome um, Greg back. As I noted, he's been here for many years. Not only does he has, have his degree here, but as some of you know, he was the um, um, PI on um, the panel study of income dynamics for many, many years. And in fact, if you go to that sixth floor conference room, um, at ISR, there's this great picture of Greg and Mary Carker and working together, I assume, on some arcane problem in the panel study of income and dynamics. And uh, you can see the younger Greg Duncan there at work. But um, it is just a delight to welcome him today. He is going to talk about a book which he has worked on in one form or another for, I know, more than a decade. Um, and this book is sort of the, um, the, the, the summary of all that work and how, what came out of it, Higher Ground. Um, which is a part of this project called New Hope, which really was, I think, one of the most exciting demonstration projects running in the 1990s, and which continues to have quite a wide, wide variety of applications um, from New Hope to a whole set of interesting policy issues. And that's what the book is about, and that's what Greg will talk about. Great. Thanks so much. It's, uh, it's terrific to be here. It's great to see old friends, including Jim Morgan up in the audience. Jim Morgan is Mr. PSID. He was director of the PSID before I uh, got involved as a graduate student. Um, and thanks to Becky. Becky has special connections to the New Hope Project. She was on the research advisory board uh, as it was being developed. Uh, I think she read two drafts of the book itself. Uh, as an informal reviewer and then as an official reviewer. Uh, so thanks so much to, uh, to Becky for all her contributions. I want to um, talk today about the book, Higher Ground, New Hope for the Working Poor and Their Children, not to be confused with <laughs> Mike Huckabee's book, From Hope to Higher Ground. Uh, it's an author's worst fear. It was uh, literally two weeks before our book was coming out when I uh, sat down for my daily dose of The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Mark Huckabee was a guest, and here he comes on with the title From Hope to Higher Ground. So uh, we'll see which higher ground ends up selling more. <laughs> Let me um, introduce New Hope uh, by giving you um, stories of three women uh, who we feature in the book, and the different circumstances that uh, they found themselves in uh, on the verge of their entry into the New Hope program. Uh, the first woman is La Lakeisha, uh, not her real name, but in 1994, just as New Hope was starting, uh, Lakeisha is an African American. Uh, she was 24 years of age, a single mother of three young children, uh, Lakeisha had married at 20, but was now separated from her unfaithful husband, who was paying no child support, and Lakeisha was, uh, had received welfare uh, continuously since the birth of her first child. Um, Lakeisha turns out to be uh, a very um, uh, 
stern parent, not a harsh parent, but uh, is very concerned with uh, her children's lives as they grow up. Uh, her personal appearance is immaculate. Her clothes are always dressed. Uh, clothes are always well pressed. But in terms of her prospects for gaining employment, uh, Lakeisha has relatively little going for her. Um, when she was a junior in high school, she uh, lost interest, said she felt lazy and just stopped going to school. She's had no real work experience uh, during the uh, five years since finishing high school. Um, she lacks confidence in her skills. Uh, she's rather easily overwhelmed when, uh, when things aren't going well. Um, she wants to get a GED. In 1994, the Wisconsin welfare reforms were pushing everyone into work. Um, she wanted to get a full-time job, but didn't really know how to do it. So um, she was, in many respects, uh, a classic uh, case of uh, a welfare-dependent mother uh, who was facing uh, an uncertain prospect as she wanted to transition into uh, the world of work. Uh, and New Hope uh, turned out to offer her some tools that uh, benefited her uh, substantially. Um, the second woman, uh, Inez, in 1994, she's Puerto Rican. Uh, she was raised by a single mother in New York. Uh, she's age 20 in 1994 on the verge of New Hope, uh, mother of a, a baby boy, father's in jail. She's now living with uh, another man uh, who soon becomes the father of her second child. She too is receiving welfare, but uh, is really very ambitious. She has a high school diploma. She has substantial work experience. Uh, she's working part-time uh, and definitely wants to work full-time, but she can't pull together the childcare to do that. Um, she has great self-confidence. Uh, she tells her ethnographer in one of the early visits, I can get any kind of job I want to if I just try hard enough. Uh, if I don't have a skill, I'll learn it. I could do anything if I set my mind to it. Uh, the third woman that we track, Elena, uh, is an immigrant from Central America. She's already working full time as a receptionist in a social services agency. Uh, she has two children in 1994, a third is on the way. Uh, her husband also is in jail. Uh, and her mother has taken a job, making it very difficult for her childcare arrangements to, uh, to work out. So she comes into the program uh, already working full time, but needs uh, a set of supports to make that full time work work for her. New Hope was a program uh, developed in the Milwaukee community by community activists. Uh, it's a voluntary program. Uh, it was initiated by the community, although soon won the uh, support of the business community as well. Uh, it was designed to help low-income adults, both men and women. It's not a welfare kind of program directed only at uh, women with children. Um, use full-time work uh, to support themselves and their families. It's a package of benefits available to people who can demonstrate uh, that they've worked 30 hours or more per week. Um, so the offices were set up and arranged uh, a set of benefits that families could choose from, provided that they worked 30 hours a week. The benefits included a wage supplement uh, that brought family income above the poverty line. Uh, it involved uh, child care subsidies, which were available so families could get decent quality child care uh, with what they paid uh, geared to a sliding scale based on their income. If they didn't have health insurance from their jobs, uh, health insurance was available through a uh, uh, HMO, uh, similar to what uh, Medicaid offered. Uh, that too was subsidized on a sliding scale. Uh, if someone came into New Hope uh, unable to get a job in the private market, there was a network of community service jobs that were available uh, that the program arranged for that provided six months of a temporary job uh, and an additional six months if that was necessary. These were jobs that uh, the participants had to apply for. Uh, they weren't make work jobs, they were real jobs. Uh, they paid the minimum wage. And the idea was for people who uh, needed work experience to be successful in the private market, 
these community service jobs would provide that to them. And the whole package was administered uh, by a set of knowledgeable, respectful, and supportive caseworkers. That was the uh, that was the package. One way of thinking about New Hope uh, is expressed by uh, David Reamer, who's one of the designers of, of New Hope. Uh, he says, New Hope is literally you and me across a table. You're a low-income adult and have some needs. I'm here to offer you some tools that will connect you with the labor market. If you'd like to take up this offer, we'll help you. If not, that's fine. You can always come back. And if there are things you're interested in that I don't offer, well, then maybe I can refer you to those. So again, a voluntary program offering a cafeteria of benefits that people could take up or not depending on their situation, uh, intended to help make work work uh, for people who wanted full-time work. New Hope uh, was tried out in two Milwaukee neighborhoods. I don't know how many of you know uh, Milwaukee, but uh, there, the Menominee River runs right down the middle of uh, um, the Milwaukee city area uh, above to the north are mostly African-American low-income neighborhoods. Uh, to the south, mostly Hispanic neighborhoods. Uh, New Hope opened its doors uh, to families in one north side and one south side neighborhood based on zip code. Uh, they raised about $18 million worth of money to run the program and evaluate it, uh, which provided a, a scale of operation that uh, enabled them to enroll about 700 families altogether. Uh, and they drew from both these north side and south side neighborhoods. The evaluation of New Hope was a uh, random assignment. Uh, MDRC was the uh, uh, contracting evaluator. This is one of the things that the uh, expert panel that Becky served on insisted on. It was one of the things that the uh, business community that ended up supporting New Hope uh, wanted as well. It involved then recruiting about 1,400 families altogether, uh, telling them right up front that they had only a 50-50 chance of actually getting into the program, um, rolling the dice, as it were, and assigning about 700 families into the New Hope program, uh, 700 families to the control comparison, uh, and then it tracked both groups, uh, now eight years beyond the point of random assignment. Uh, it's important to always understand what the counterfactual is with program evaluation. Uh, I'll talk more about uh, the conditions in Wisconsin, but uh, you always are getting a comparison between what the New Hope group uh, is experiencing and what the control group is experiencing. And the control group was experiencing uh, a lot of welfare reforms that the state of Wisconsin was, uh, was implementing. So it's that kind of contrast. So a lot of the results uh, in my involvement uh, with New Hope uh, was in conjunction with the MacArthur Child uh, Network on uh, Middle Childhood. Bob Granger is now president of WT Grant, uh, was at MDRC at the time, and got our uh, network group, uh, including Aletha Houston and Tom Wisner and myself, uh, the co-authors of the book, um, connected to an MDRC uh, project, New Hope. Uh, and the um, New Hope itself was set up to concentrate mostly on uh, employment kind of outcomes, welfare kind of outcomes, and we extended the uh, evaluation to include family outcomes and child outcomes. We were especially interested in the extent to which an economic uh, program like New Hope might work through the family and have effects on kids. So the, the model um, that guided our thinking about what New Hope might do begins with the actual provisions of the program itself, uh, the 30-hour work threshold for uh, eligibility, uh, the earnings supplement, child care subsidy, health insurance, community service job, the CSJ, uh, if needed, and supportive caseworkers, these key elements of the New Hope package. Um, those provisions um, were expected to induce certain changes in the adults uh, participating in New Hope. Uh, increase employment, reduce welfare receipt, uh, increase total family income. Our interest was in extending um, 
this from the adult behavior impacts to the impacts on the family and the children. So if you think about what, how children might conceivably be affected by a New Hope kind of program, you have to think about changes uh, in, child's, in the child's resources and the child's context that are set in motion by this program uh, that might in turn affect uh, how well the children are doing. So the higher income uh, could increase the family's uh, material well-being to the advantage of kids. Um, the employment um, and higher income might affect uh, parenting, might make parenting less harsh, uh, which would benefit kids. The uh, child care subsidy of New Hope plus the higher income could well affect a family's use of child care and community programs. Um, various aspects of the provision of New Hope could improve maternal mental health, uh, support for the mother, which in turn could affect the kids. And finally, the health insurance subsidy uh, could affect the nature of the health care for the kids. So this is the kind of model that we had in mind as we went about the evaluation uh, in assessing uh, what the kind of bottom line impacts are for the kids, as well as the process by which those uh, impacts might have played out. So let's think about the context in which New Hope developed. Uh, New Hope opened its doors uh, in the fall of 1994. Uh, think back, for those old enough to think back, to 1994. Uh, welfare reform was in the works. Uh, Ron Haskins was here not long ago talking about what was going on in Washington at this time. The federal reforms uh, passed in uh, August 1996, which is right in the middle of the point that New Hope was in operation. It was the dividing line between the old world of AFDC and the new world of TANF. Um, in Wisconsin, welfare reform started long before uh, it started on the federal stage. Tommy Thompson, the long-serving governor in uh, Wisconsin, started in 1986. Uh, and I think the year after he took office, he cut AFTC benefits uh, by a token amount um, and put the state on notice that he was uh, concerned with uh, reforming welfare. And that turned out to be a very popular um, set of actions that he took. So various reforms were introduced uh, over the late 1990s into the, uh, over the late uh, 1980s into the early 1990s. By the time New Hope was in operation, uh, Wisconsin had put in place a set of diversion programs. So people coming in to apply for cash assistance were diverted to uh, a series of job search uh, kind of programs that they had to go through satisfactorily before they could receive any sort of uh, cash benefits. So it was a very serious pre-welfare reform attempt to, um, to get uh, welfare uh, recipients uh, into the world of work. Um, with the passage of the federal uh, legislation in 1996, all the states had to come up with a, a, a new uh, welfare program that was consistent with the legislation. And Wisconsin's uh, was Wisconsin Works. Uh, and that officially started in 1997. So if you think about the evaluation here, we're going to be comparing families that were offered this package of work condition benefits from New Hope, uh, but the control families were going through the turmoil of welfare reform uh, in Wisconsin during exactly the same time. And it's the difference between those two groups that we're going to be focusing on. The evaluation of New Hope uh, was unusually comprehensive. Uh, when People signed up for the chance to get into New Hope. They signed away their life in terms of administrative data that could be gathered about them. So we knew both before uh, the baseline signing up as well as uh, up to eight years after uh, what their earnings were according to administrative data, what their uh, cash welfare receipt was, what food stamps looked like. So we had a great deal of administrative data that we could track on a continuous basis, people's employment and income. Uh, we conducted, or MDRC conducted, a baseline survey right at the point just prior to random assignment to gather information about demographic uh, conditions. Uh, we did a two-year survey, two years after the point of random assignment. So this is still in the middle of uh, New Hope. New Hope was a, 
uh, was offered on a 36-month, three-year calendar basis to everybody. Uh, so this two-year survey was timed to come 24 months after they uh, signed up for the program and started being eligible. Um, we followed up with a, a five-year after baseline survey, which would be two years after the end of uh, the New Hope program. We still had interesting results, so we could still get money to do an eight-year evaluation. Uh, so that's going to be five years after um, the end of the, uh, of the program. Uh, not all the data are analyzed from the eight-year follow-up, but I'll, I'll provide some information about that. Um, what's unusual in our evaluation uh, is that we built in an ethnographic component. Tom Weisner, who's a cultural anthropologist, uh, led this effort. Um, we went round and round on how many families, how to pick the families, and ended up um, deciding uh, my arguments based on years in the Survey Research Center, uh, thinking that sampling was a good way to do it, was to literally take a random sample of 22 families from the control group, 22 families from the experimental group, um, and follow these families uh, periodically over the course of three years, and then we did a follow-up in 1994. So we had uh, field workers um, visit these families every six weeks or so. They collected a great deal of, uh, it, it, it was a, um, a, a semi-structured kind of interview plus a lot of observation, trying to get an idea of uh, what was really happening to the families, the family routines, uh, what was happening to the kids, how uh, New Hope was playing out uh, in the lives of these families, how the, the parents participating in New Hope perceived New Hope. Um, we started this, we wish we had started earlier, but we started in the last year of New Hope operation. We were able to observe families over the transition as they were transitioning out of New Hope to try to see what sort of changes uh, were caused by the loss of benefits. Um, our ethnographers spent time in family gatherings and restaurants, just trying to get an idea of what was going on with the families. And uh, because we had a, a random sample uh, from both the experimental and control groups, 44 isn't enough to do a lot of quantitative analysis, but you did get a pretty broad sense of what was going on. Uh, in the book, uh, Lakeisha, Inez, and Elena are three of the families from the ethnography um, that all were in the program group. Um, and we chose them in uh, as, systematically, as systematic a way as, as we possibly could. We took the um, basic findings from the evaluation, from the quantitative evaluation, and wrote out a list of about eight or nine lessons that were really important uh, from, the, uh, from the evaluation. And then we tried to select uh, cases that collectively represented uh, as many of those lessons as we could. So that was the... Uh, uh, the selection plan, and uh, those were the three women whose stories we featured most uh, in the book. Um, we also drew from uh, the other ethnographic cases. Uh, one thing you find is there's tremendous heterogeneity. Uh, some families were much more successful than others. Uh, some families couldn't be bothered by New Hope, even though they, uh, they signed up for it and they discovered that it really wasn't for them. Um, so we bring in evidence from uh, other families as well, but we really try to uh, spend the most time acquainting readers with, uh, with these three families. If you just look at the characteristics of the New Hope families at baseline, they're about 1,400 or so altogether, half in the control group, half in the experimental group. Um, remember, New Hope was uh, not just a welfare program. It was available to all low-income adults uh, living in these two neighborhood areas. So almost a third of the people who came into New Hope were already working full-time. They saw New Hope as a chance to take that full-time work uh, and uh, make it more profitable for them, the earnings supplement, the child care supports, and so forth. So a third of the people were already working full-time. Um, it wasn't restricted to female heads of households, so almost 30% of participants were males. Um, they didn't have to have kids in the household. Again, the idea was that this should be a set of work supports uh, 
universally available to full-time workers who just weren't earning enough to, uh, to have a family income above the poverty line. Um, most but not all had kids in the household. Drawing from these two neighborhoods, about half of the participants were African American, 27% Hispanic. Uh, most but not all had received uh, cash assistance in the past year. So it's, uh, I know Jason DeParle came and uh, spoke about his wonderful book. Um, he was really focusing on African American long-term welfare recipients uh, in Milwaukee. Um, and the New Hope population is um, broader than that. Uh, it, it, it's somewhat more selective than that because these are the people who volunteered for this program that required them to work full time before they could get any benefits. Um, so it's more representative of the working poor than it is of the kind of welfare, long-term welfare recipients that Jason DeParle talks about. Um, there was a pretty serious implementation study that uh, MDRC did. If you think about the task of implementing a program like this, uh, it's pretty formidable. You've got to work out a, uh, an earning supplement system so that marginal tax rates don't go uh, through the roof, and they work very carefully on that. You've got to line up um, this child care subsidy with child care providers in a way that someone walks in the office um, and needs child care. You want to be able to deliver that to them within a, a few days. Um, you had to line up this health uh, insurance subsidy, the HMO, which they did. Uh, and then they had to line up a set of about 300 community service jobs. So that, that was the number of, of people who ended up taking uh, community service jobs. Um, and that was done uh, through connections with uh, various nonprofits in the Milwaukee area. You really wanted work situations that were real work situations. Um, but that were supported work situations for people who really needed the work experience. Um, you didn't want make work kind of situations. You wanted a, a real job that people could have for, on a temporary basis uh, that would be used as a stepping stone into to private employment. So all of those things were uh, arranged and pretty much in place when New Hope opened its doors uh, in the fall of 1994. Um, and the big surprise was, um, with this wonderful set of benefits being offered, even though everyone, almost everyone who was eligible for those benefits um, at some point during their 36 months, um, only half of them took up any benefit in any particular month. Right? So it was, um, it, was, it was a shock to uh, the, the Duho people that this wonderful set of benefits weren't always taken up. And one of the tasks was really to understand why it was that the take up was so, uh, was so hit and miss. Um, heterogeneity is the clue to understanding everything. And uh, it's no exception here. You can really think of very different kind of participants coming in and being attracted to, uh, to something like New Hope. Uh, some took up most of the benefits all the time. Um, some came in already working full time. It turned out their income was close enough to the, the, the cutoffs that they weren't getting that much out of the program. They had to come in once a month. That was too much of a hassle. So they just decided they couldn't be bothered with the, uh, with the hassle. Um, some, as you might expect, uh, just had other problems that made it very difficult for them to come up with the 30 hours a week. Uh, sometimes there were drug problems, sometimes depression problems. Um, New Hope wasn't set up to address those kind of problems. There were referrals to community agencies that provided help with those kinds of things. But, uh, but the New Hope program itself um, was conditioned on the fact that people were able to work 30 hours, uh, perhaps with the help of a community service job at first, uh, and then provided the, uh, the list of benefits conditioned on that 30 hours. Um, and here's where the ethnography came in very handy. Some, uh, some came in uh, but just used one benefit. And it turned out that it was a very rational kind of process that most families engaged in, where um, they might have already had an acceptable childcare arrangement with a relative. And what they really needed was 
just the health insurance because they weren't getting that in their, uh, their job. Um, other people um, desperately needed the community service uh, job in order to, to get work experience. Um, Elena, uh, who I mentioned before, was the Central American immigrant. She was already working full time. Uh, her mother uh, had just taken a job. Her mother had been providing the childcare for her kids. Uh, so she was desperate for, uh, for decent quality childcare for her kids. And she only took up the New Hope benefit for uh, childcare. It was the only one that she was interested in. Um, and some came in um, for the caseworker support. Remember, this package of benefits was administered in a central office by uh, caseworkers that were very carefully trained to support these work efforts. And in some cases, um, they just had to process the paperwork. In other cases, they had to spend quite a bit of time uh, with the participants to make them aware of what sort of supports were available and to, uh, uh, to help them in various ways uh, with the confidence they needed or uh, advice that they needed to be able to actually get these full-time jobs and qualify for the benefits. So if you think about the nature of the program, it's really different from um, the typical way we think about programs where there's an EITC or there's a child care subsidy and they're all being administered by different agencies. Um, New Hope's model was more of a cafeteria of benefits that condition on 30 hours a week, this was available, see what you like, let's work it out so you can take up those benefits. Uh, if there are benefits that just don't make sense for you and your family now, that's fine. We'll just concentrate on the benefits that do. So I think that was one of the great strengths of New Hope, uh, was this flexibility uh, in this one-stop shopping uh, that states have tried to put in place but uh, haven't been very successful in most cases. So let me talk about the impacts of New Hope. It was random assignment, so we can do these comparisons between the experimental group and the control group. Um, let me take a moment to set up this um, graph here. This is taking administrative data on um, what fraction of uh, New Hope and control families were showing up in payroll records in any particular quarter. We've got quarterly data here. So we're gearing uh, the quarter here to the point of random assignment. That's quarter zero, right? These are the quarters prior to random assignment. These are the quarters afterwards. The shaded area starting at zero, uh, running up to 12 quarters, is the 36 months that they were eligible for New Hope. Uh, we're showing in the solid line uh, the fraction of New Hope uh, participants who were showing up in the administrative data in a particular quarter. The dashed line is the correspondence between the experimental and controls. Uh, first thing to notice, always look at what's going on with the control group first. Look at the, uh, the dashed line around the point of uh, random assignment. These are families that came in interested in New Hope supports but lost the lottery and they ended up in the control group. Uh, that group had uh, labor supply increases on the order of 10 to 15 points. That's the control group. They didn't get anything from New Hope, right? They were just living in the middle of the drumbeat of uh, welfare reform in Wisconsin. Uh, they were self-selected, being attracted to New Hope but with this opportunity to make the work work. So they were uh, in the process of, of trying to do that on their own. Uh, they just weren't lucky enough to be in the, the New Hope lottery. So the, the, the test for New Hope isn't whether uh, employment increased. It did by almost 20 points. But how much better did New Hope do relative to the control group? And that's uh, the difference, uh, which is over the course of the uh, 36 months, uh, almost always significant. The, the diamonds down here represent a statistically significant difference uh, with uh, employment rates um, seven to 10 points more for the experimental group relative to the control group. By the uh, end of the program period, these differences have faded to uh, insignificance, and they're essentially zero after that. If you have questions about the data that I'm going to present, please uh, ask them. So overall, uh, for New Hope, there were modest uh, employment effects. 
uh, during the program uh, that faded quickly after the program ended. I should say that the designers of New Hope and the, uh, the business community that supported the uh, designers conceived of New Hope as a perpetual program. It's the set of supports that ought to be available to America's working poor. But for the purpose of uh, actually running the evaluation, they had to time limit uh, New Hope. Um, so that's the overall result. It's always good to ask, uh, is there a, a substantial subgroup within the overall group that matched the program model the closest, right? Where the benefits might be larger, uh, and more persistent. And this again was one of the advantages of the uh, uh, field work. Uh, Catherine Magnuson, who's now at uh, Wisconsin, uh, was one of the field workers and um, took on this task of trying to look through the ethnographic notes and understand um, what kind of families seem to be benefiting the most from the program. And she uh, drew from the literature that uh, Sandy Danzinger and others have uh, contributed to um, that frames uh, employment barriers as being very important. And the idea was uh, that families that didn't seem to have any employment barriers, families that are already working full time, um, weren't likely to get uh, big benefits from New Hope. Their employment wasn't likely to be affected. They were already working. right? Uh, and the control group was probably going to do just as well as the New Hope group. Uh, similarly, if you think about families that have multiple barriers, where there's a, uh, a, a drug problem, a depression problem, a serious set of uh, barriers, uh, they're not likely to be helped very much by a program like New Hope. Did, New Hope didn't offer services uh, to address those kind of serious needs. But maybe there's uh, a group in the middle, uh, the people who are somewhat constrained but not overly constrained, where uh, the family is just one barrier away from really being able to uh, make it in the labor market. And that was the idea, and she developed a, uh, a barrier index uh, based on a diverse set of criteria where, uh, for example, um, having uh, two or more young children were counted as a barrier, uh, not having uh, a high school diploma was a barrier, not having work experience was a barrier. Uh, having uh, been in prison was a barrier. So you can develop a, an index based on various kinds of barriers that might be addressed by program components. So if someone has a jail record, the community service job provides the kind of experience uh, that might lead them into the, the private labor market. Uh, obviously, people with uh, a couple of young kids are going to benefit from the, the child care subsidy. So the idea was that if you could uh, form this barrier index and look at people who had just a small number of barriers, that they might indeed be the, the subset of participants who benefited the most. And sure enough, that was the case. Um, it turned out that nearly half the sample, 42%, had just one employment barrier. So here we've got the same kind of administrative data, but just for the 42% with the one, uh, one barrier to employment. And for them, uh, the impacts were larger, more consistently around the 10 percentage point level. Uh, but what's amazing is that they were uh, enduring. Uh, they held for not only during the program period, uh, but as long as we've been able to track them five years after the, uh, the program. So this group indeed seems to be uh, the group that fit best to the program model and their uh, labor market success seems to uh, reflect uh, permanent advantages imparted by the program uh, as a result. Um, let me turn to family impacts. Remember, uh, New Hope was really about the idea that if you work full time, you shouldn't be poor. So tracking family poverty was an important uh, outcome. Uh, during New Hope, family poverty rates, um, this is constructed from administrative data and not uh, a, a full accounting of family income. But if you just look at the sources of administrative data, 
You get family poverty rates that are 14 percentage points lower during New Hope for the New Hope families compared to control families. Uh, and a couple of years after New Hope, uh, the difference was still significant, eight points less. Um, we expected because uh, family income was higher and poverty rates were lower that there would be impacts on uh, material hardships, but there, there weren't that many. Uh, it was as though the margin that the income advantages were working on weren't so much at the very basic levels of meeting needs as they were above the next level up. Um, being able to afford childcare, for example, being able to uh, afford other kinds of things. Um, there were no impacts on welfare receipt, um, but again, you have to think about what's happening in the control group. Rates of welfare receipt fell 50% uh, among the New Hope group, but they also fell 50% among the control group. This was the uh, peak period in Wisconsin when the welfare rolls were declining by 80% altogether. Um, and uh, the control group was caught up as much in that decline as the New Hope group was. If you look to other kind of uh, family system uh, effects, there were quite substantial impacts on families' use of formal child care. You might expect that because of the child care subsidy. Uh, but it extended to other kinds of formal programs like after school programs. Um, there were also positive impacts on uh, questions related to social support, the kind of uh, help that the caseworkers might be able to provide. What's interesting is that we also asked uh, questions about the, their awareness of community resources, not the kind of things that New Hope offered, but the kind of things that were available in the community that New Hope caseworkers might have referred them to. Uh, and there were significant differences between New Hope families and control families, not only during New Hope, but also a couple of years after. Uh, and then there were scattered effects, uh, less than we had expected on uh, various measures of maternal health. So let me turn to child impacts. We're working our way across that, uh, uh, that flow chart. Um, we would have expected that this combination of higher income, less poverty, uh, more formal child care use, um, more cohesive parenting perhaps, uh, might play through to the benefit of the kids. Um, the kids we concentrated on, uh, ours was a MacArthur network on middle childhood. So we were concentrating on kids who two years after baseline were uh, age three to 12 years old. Uh, and we gather, I'm gonna talk about some of the teacher reported data uh, and these are the kids who are obviously in school, so they're six to 12 years old in, uh, uh, in the point two years after baseline. Uh, they're six to 15 years old, five years after baseline, and then uh, have a little bit of data from eight years after baseline where these kids are uh, into their adolescence for the most part. All right, so here are the two and five year impacts. As I say, the eight year impacts are still somewhat preliminary. We, um, in addition to asking uh, parents about the kids, we asked teachers about the kids. Um, we surveyed um, as many teachers as we could, uh, had a response rate of about 80% for the teacher surveys. We asked the teachers about uh, the individual children, not telling them that they were uh, in a control group or an experimental group, uh, used a standard kind of achievement rating um, that's uh, asked of teachers in the developmental literature as well as uh, classroom behavior. Uh, for the kids themselves, we conducted uh, interviews with them and asked them about their college expectations. These are, uh, these are impacts. These are the differences between the New Hope kids and the control kids expressed as a fraction of uh, standard deviation for the given measure. So at two years, um, the teachers for the New Hope kids were reporting uh, achievement rates that were about uh, a fifth of a standard deviation higher than the rates for the control group. Um, by five years after random assignment, two years after the end of the program, that difference had faded in significance. Uh, positive uh, classroom behavior was significant at two years, but not five. Uh, at both two years and five, though, uh, there were significant differences in college expectations. 
uh, favoring the New Hope group relative to the control group. The surprise came when we looked at uh, gender differences in these impacts. Here, we present the same kind of data only for the boys in New Hope families. Um, and for them, the impacts were considerably larger and considerably more enduring. So for the boys, uh, teachers were reporting achievement at two years and five years that was about close to a third of a standard deviation higher for the experimental kids relative to the control kids. Uh, behavior differences were equally positive in favor of the, the Do Hope kids. And then these college expectations were uh, 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 about four tenths of a standard deviation higher for the experimental group. And they also didn't fade. So the real triumph of New Hope uh, was in these child impacts for the boys. Um, it's a very interesting kind of gender story. Why should it be that uh, New Hope is affecting uh, the boys so positively but not the girls? Uh, one thing, if you just look at the raw data, um, the girls are doing much better than the boys are. So you can think of the girls as being up here, uh, both the New Hope girls and the control girls. The uh, control boys are down here, and what New Hope does is essentially bring the, the experimental boys up to the level of the girls. So there might be something of a ceiling effect going on, but again, we pushed our... Um, ethnographers to try to um, help us understand why it might be that the boys do better. We could look at, um, at some of the survey data and see were there any family system kind of impacts uh, for boys that were more positive than they were for girls. Uh, one of the impacts shows up uh, for formal child care, uh, extended day programs. Uh, New Hope families tended to enroll their boys more than their girls relative to controls uh, in these kind of after-school programs. Um, but we also found a lot of stories uh, like this in the ethnography. Uh, this is Jackie, a 35-year-old mother of four, um, who explicitly talks about uh, the fact she has both boys and girls, uh, but that she's more concerned about her boys and uh, spends more of her New Hope money on boys. My neighborhood is infested with gangs and drugs. It's different for girls and boys. Gangs are full of older men who want these young boys to do their dirty work, and they'll buy them things and give them money. Right? So the story, again, these kids were uh, elementary school uh, when this uh, ethnography uh, was running. Uh, the parents were uh, considerably more concerned about their boys and their girls. Um, they reacted to that differential concern by being more likely to channel their boys into the um, into Head Start programs, into formal child care programs, into after school programs. Um, they talked about using uh, some of the earning supplements to, uh, to buy uh, tennis shoes and the kind of things that uh, the gangs would have gotten for the kids had they not. So it's a very, um, we didn't expect this, but it's a very uh, sensible kind of story given the differential concern that the parents had in these um, quite dangerous neighborhoods, differential concern for their boys relative to their girls. Um, Eight-year impacts are still preliminary at this point. Uh, we continue to see positive impacts for boys relative to girls, oh, I'm sorry, for experimental boys relative to control boys. Um, in terms of behavior, uh, no impacts on test scores. This is five years after the end of New Hope. Uh, and again, what was very surprising, um, not so much earlier, but in eight years, there are these consistently positive effects on parent-child relations. Again, these kids started out in elementary school. They're now in adolescence. Um, and across a host of um, parent-child relation kind of measures, the Y indicates a youth report. A P indicates a parenting report. Um, you observe uh, these adolescents now in New Hope families uh, and their parents reporting better parent-child relationships. We, we swore eight years was going to be the last time. <laughs> we wrote the proposal, got the money, went out and did the survey. Uh, we're kind of hoping there wouldn't be any effects at, uh, at eight years to uh, have to follow up on, but you've got to wonder, 
one of the results from um, welfare reform experiments more, experiments more generally is that for kids who are adolescents at the time the treatment started, uh, you tended to find negative impacts rather than positive impacts, even among programs that, that boosted income. And what New Hope might have done for the younger kids is provide them with a set of benefits, skills, higher achievement, better behavior, um, better uh, family kind of conditions um, that enabled them to make this transition into adolescence and perhaps beyond uh, in a more positive kind of way. That's, that's the, the hypothesis that we should probably test. Um, so if we were to get more money to gather uh, data, say, on uh, crime, if you really want to try to tote up the, uh, the benefits relative to the cost of New Hope, um, you might expect this better behavior, better parent-child relations uh, to play out in ways that can generate some real financial benefits for, uh, for society, if you think about it in a cost-benefit kind of context. Um, it's easy to get excited by New Hope. Uh, I started out as an evaluator and uh, have ended up being something of an advocate, which makes me uncomfortable. But, um, but I do think, as our nation uh, thinks about the next step beyond welfare reform, uh, to the kinds of work supports they should provide. They're, they've expanded work supports, a higher EITC, more child care subsidy. Um, but still, there are 8 million kids living in families in the United States uh, where a parent's working full time and, and they're still living in poverty. There are about 7 million adults in that, uh, in that category. So despite welfare reform, uh, plus 10 years, uh, we still have a situation where a lot of uh, families are working full-time uh, and are still poor. So what sort of programs might we think about that would attack this problem? And New Hope is a potential model for those kinds of uh, situations. If you add up the benefits, um, there were these employment gains, uh, especially among the families that were uh, just one barrier away from being able to sustain full-time work. Uh, poverty reductions are quite substantial. Um, and these achievement gains in particular uh, and behavior gains for the boys. The costs, uh, if you towed up the uh, taxpayer costs, New Hope was not a cheap program. Uh, in today's dollars, about $6,600 more than uh, what Wisconsin was offering at the time New Hope uh, was in operation. Again, this is always relative to what uh, is already in place. If you look at um, what Wisconsin has in place now, uh, partly because of New Hope, they've uh, instituted a quite generous child care subsidy uh, system, uh, uh, a quite generous uh, health insurance uh, subsidy system. So the incremental cost of New Hope in Wisconsin today would probably be about half the $6,600, $3,300 per year, which is still, uh, which is still a substantial amount. If you look at the nature of New Hope costs, uh, the biggest chunk went for these childcare subsidies, uh, which proved to be the most popular kind of component. Uh, it was a, a generous subsidy for high quality care, and high quality care costs a lot of money. So 38% of the total cost of incremental cost of New Hope went for uh, childcare subsidies, about a third for program costs, and the rest were scattered across the other components, the health insurance, earning supplements, and community service job wages. So that's the, um, the range of costs, $3,300 today per year, $6,600 back when New Hope is in operation. Um, if you add up the employment benefits, it was a fairly modest set of uh, differences. Uh, even for the one barrier people, you don't get uh, earnings benefits that uh, come close to $6,600 per year. The, uh, the kicker is really to what extent these child benefits, uh, impacts on achievement, impacts on behavior, uh, will pay off in the way that the uh, Perry Preschool program is paid off in lower crime, uh, the kind of things that really generate uh, substantial benefits to taxpayers. So that's uh, an unknown that we may or may not follow up with uh, future rounds of research. 
Um, another problem we have to worry about, New Hope was a community-initiated program operating in Milwaukee for three years in the mid-1990s. Um, can you possibly replicate New Hope on a, a, a state level, a national level? Uh, here, I think there are grounds for optimism. Uh, New Hope wasn't the only kind of welfare reform that uh, was tried out experimentally in the 1990s. Uh, a couple of them, uh, Minnesota in particular, uh, was rather like the New Hope program. Uh, Minnesota, with its MFIP program, uh, reformed its uh, welfare offices, retrained their caseworkers to uh, support work rather than just write welfare checks. Um, it too was evaluated with random assignment. Uh, it too boosted income about the same extent that New Hope did. Uh, it too generated uh, positive impacts on achievement and behavior of kids. So uh, the Minnesota program shows that you can indeed uh, replicate some of the basic findings from uh, New Hope in the context of a government administrated uh, program. Uh, there were Canadian and Connecticut experiments that also uh, boosted work, boosted income, and boosted child achievement. Uh, in contrast, there were an additional set of programs that were focused on work uh, that did boost work but didn't have any change in uh, family income, and there were no child benefits associated with those. So from this kind of scattered experimental evidence, it appears that key elements of New Hope uh, can indeed uh, be replicated, including some of the key results. Um, so who cares about whether the impacts can be replicated? Can the story be published? Uh, so let me, let me say a word about uh, the book itself. Uh, Russell Sage uh, runs a scholar in residence program, which I recommend to everybody. Um, it's a wonderful year in New York. The price is that you have to write a book. And uh, we were eager to take on the, the challenge because we had uh, lived with New Hope so long and we wanted to tell the story of, of New Hope. So I talked with uh, Suzanne Nichols, the head of publications, um, and said, I want to write a book. We've got these reports uh, from MDRC that detail all the findings. We don't want to do another technical report. We'd like to write a book that might reach a broader audience. Um, she said, well, you got to write that book, but you can't put any tables and you can't put any figures in. <laughs> Never in my life have I uh, had an occasion to write anything without tables and figures. Um, it was kind of fun. We, we used these ethnographic cases, as I described, um, drew them very carefully from the uh, results of the overall evaluation um, and tried in a mini Jason DeParle kind of way to use the qualitative stories to drive the narrative um, to explain uh, the nature of the labor supply impacts, to explain the nature of the family impacts, to give people an idea of what the participants were actually like, how they uh, experienced the program, um, who were the people for whom the program seemed to work, who were the people for whom the program didn't seem to work, um, and that's uh, all done in the book in 124 pages. That was another uh, requirement that we didn't want to do a uh, long book, but we wanted to be able to tell the story not only of, of the, the program itself, but of the um, development of the program, uh, the people in Milwaukee that, uh, that dreamed this up. Uh, they worked on it for 15 years before they actually opened their doors. Um, the very interesting story of the Milwaukee uh, business elite that became interested in, uh, in New Hope uh, did heavy-duty political support on behalf of New Hope. New Hope had to raise money not only from foundations uh, in the federal government, but also from the state of Wisconsin. And you can imagine Tommy Thompson is sitting there with a much more punitive kind of uh, approach to, uh, to welfare reform. New Hope is the experiment, W2 is the control group. Any sort of positive result for New Hope is going to be showing that New Hope's better than what Tommy Thompson had put in place. So members of uh, the Milwaukee business community used up a lot of uh, political chips to lobby 
uh, the Wisconsin state government to, to put money into and otherwise support New Hope, and they succeeded in that. So it's this uh, really coalition that came about because of the work focus of New Hope, the 30 hour per week requirement that led both the uh, advocates and the, uh, the business community to be uh, very enthusiastic about it uh, and for me to be very enthusiastic about telling a story to you. Thank you very much. Uh, community service jobs, um, as I said, there are about 300 of them lined up all together. Uh, they tended to be in, the, in community nonprofits. Uh, they were uh, receptionist kind of jobs, oftentimes. Um, for men, uh, they were uh, sometimes receptionist jobs, but sometimes, uh, you know, fairly basic kind of uh, work. They were intended to be uh, real jobs. People had to apply for them. They paid the minimum wage and only the minimum wage. In Milwaukee at this time, business conditions were really hot. Unemployment was very low. So the going wage was really considerably higher than minimum wage. So it wasn't attractive uh, to take a community service job if you could actually get a, a private sector job. The, um, the 30 hours of community service work uh, qualified people for the set of New Hope benefits, including the, uh, the earning subsidy. So it was, uh, it was trying to simulate a real world job with a little bit of sheltering uh, to get people through the, uh, the six month period. But you know, if they weren't showing up, they'd be fired from the job. It wasn't a, a coddling kind of uh, situation. It was more of a supportive kind of situation. Yeah? So if these are minimum wage jobs, did they have another job at the side um, to raise them above that poverty line? Or is it just the new home job and no other job? Um, these were people who, uh, who could not get other jobs on the side, right? These are people like Lakeisha, I started uh, explaining. She had no work experience, lacked confidence. Um, she had no clue as to how to go about getting a, a private sector job. So the community service job that was providing this 30 hour a week work uh, was really her stepping stone into the private labor market. Uh, and she was just not in a position to uh, have any other sort of job at the same time. They were, I'm sorry. You mentioned that 30% came in full time, full, had full time employment when they came in. Right. So did they keep that other job and do the new no, job? No, 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 no. The, the community service job, mm -hmm. like all the other benefits, were purely voluntary. <clears throat> right? And most New Hope participants didn't take a community service job at all. 70% of them didn't take a community service job. But 30% did. And those are the ones who weren't already working who needed the community service job as a stepping stone into the labor market. Yeah, George. Um, can you say a little bit about the, the business community support? What percent of the total funding came from the business community? Was it a small number of key actors? Was it a broad base? And, and how was it framed uh, to get support? Um, there was some corporation support, but not very much. Most of the support came from the, the lobbying efforts uh, that the Greater Milwaukee Community, which is the community uh, elite group that, uh, that, that um, took this on, um, uh, engaged in. So um, New Hope was developed uh, in the community in 1988, and then they came to the Greater Milwaukee Committee around 1990 to try to um, get it to sign on. Uh, the Greater Milwaukee Committee went to Bob Haveman at Wisconsin uh, and asked uh, how they should think about this. Um, he worked with them to, um, to think about what the evaluation, you know, the, the, what sort of conditions that they might want to uh, impose to be enthusiastic about this. Uh, they, over a period of a couple years, debated back and forth there's an archive actually in uh, the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee Library that's got a lot of notes from, uh, from the Greater Milwaukee Committee uh, meeting. It's fascinating reading. Um, and you know there was some opposition, but a number of people became very excited about this. And another person that we feature in the book, uh, Tom Schrader, uh, was the CEO of Wisconsin Gas. And he uh, was fairly young when New Hope started, and he 
uh, was asked by the one of the higher ups in the Greater Milwaukee Committee to kind of take this on as a community service activity, uh, and he did, and he became a chair of the board for New Hope. Uh, very enthusiastic supporter, ended up spending a lot of time. Uh, but the uh, the group itself uh, mostly helped out by lending their seal of approval as well selectively as using their political connections, uh, mostly in the Wisconsin government, because it included the, the, the group of enthusiastic business people included some of the big time uh, Republican supporters in the state of Wisconsin. So once they took it on as a group um, and came to think that it was a good thing, uh, then a number of people became very enthusiastic supporters of it. Can you say something about um, who volunteered for the program and what you know about how they might have been written on this and being held for the program? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we can certainly describe who volunteered for the program. I put up a few statistics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some fit. Uh, there was a community survey uh, done at the same time uh, in some of the early uh, reports that contrasted um, to some extent. Uh, who the New Hope volunteers were versus others. By and large, uh, you know, there was a, a subgroup that, like Lakeisha, were pretty traditional welfare recipients. Um, you know, you have to remember a third of the people were uh, adults without children. So it's a very different group than we usually think about. Um, but then among the rest, it was uh, families with kids where um, they were uh, considerably more work ready or already working than the typical, than Jason DeParle's uh, families, for example. So it's a, a, a heterogeneous uh, mixture like that. With, but on average, they were considerably more uh, advantaged than the, in the other kind of MDRC welfare reform programs, which were targeted exclusively to uh, either longtime welfare recipients or new applicants. Uh, new Hope had some of those, but not, not mostly those. Do you know if there's sort of systematic differences with, say, people suffering from depression or health problems um, We haven't, um, we haven't done those kind of, you know, we could compare it to uh, the, the West data, I suppose. Um, but we haven't, we haven't done that. Now, I suspect, again, it's, it's somewhat more advantaged, but um, there were certainly a substantial number who had big time problems with domestic abuse. That was one of Elena's problems uh, with depression. The, the, the ones who didn't take up New Hope uh, very much at all, the multiple barrier families, which were like 30% of all the, uh, the families. Yeah, Arlen. Greg, uh, the results that you talked about seem really exciting. You talked about um, people in uh, Milwaukee working for 15 years to put this program together. But then it seemed like it uh, stopped. And I, I'd be interested in what are the, what's going on in Milwaukee, what kind of an impact? Um, are they going to take up a new program? Um, sort of that, those kinds of issues. Right. Um, but to some extent, New Hope has had an impact, I think, on Wisconsin state policy. It's always difficult to nail down exactly what influenced the state legislature to introduce a particular, particularly generous uh, health insurance program for, uh, for low-income families, a uh, particularly generous child care subsidy program. Wisconsin, you know, for all the harshness of its welfare reform, has put a ton of money into work supports. And uh, it turns out that its child care subsidy ended up looking very much like New Hope's when it finally went into effect in 1999. Uh, the Badger Care Health Insurance Program was uh, provided very similar kind of coverage to what uh, New Hope provided. So um, to a certain extent, uh, some of New Hope's features have been absorbed by the state of Wisconsin, you know, to a much greater extent than is true uh, in a lot of other states. Aletha's from Texas, and uh, when you hear about what Texas has in place, it's a, it's a very um, small set of supports relative to a place like uh, Wisconsin. So that was part of the legacy of New Hope. 
the people in New Hope, David Reamer, the, who's one of the developers, um, he's been a, a tireless advocate uh, inside of government and outside for these kind of work-based progressive reforms. Um, so he's continued his work. Julie Kirksick, who is really the heart and soul of New Hope, um, has continued on uh, consulting various <laughs> New Hope type programs, work support programs uh, around the country. So uh, we're still hoping that we can get some sort of uh, replication. Uh, MDRC is hoping this too, um, to actually see to what extent uh, a New Hope kind of program would be as successful elsewhere. So these efforts are ongoing, but they're, uh, they're, they're slow, slow and steady. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, I was curious if you could talk just a bit more about the, the health insurance take up and the health impacts. And I think that seems particularly relevant kind of in the today's policy climate. Um, and could, I imagine, have you know, really large you know, benefits in, along with the crime weighing into the cost benefit analysis? What? Right. We didn't ask extensive questions about uh, health care and health uh, conditions. And you know, kids are pretty healthy by and large, so it's, it's, it's often hard to find uh, health differences in kids. I mean, there might be underlying differences that are going to emerge uh, later in life that you really can't track with these kind of surveys. Uh, there were significant differences in the extent to which um, uh, in, in the number of dental visits and the number of doctor visits, uh, higher in the case of uh, the New Hope families relative to the control families. Uh, in terms of the pretty short inventories of health conditions, uh, there were as often as not uh, no significant impacts. Um, so. Um, there weren't big ticket uh, differences that were showing up um, that would add to the cost benefit analysis, but I'm not sure I would expect them to, uh, given the kids were as young as they were, and given the relatively few number of questions that we had to try to detect those health differences. It, and yet this generated a lot of political support for the health insurance component? Uh, yeah, mostly because, at, well, Partly because David Reamer uh, was particularly strong in the, the health insurance side of things and worked uh, very much on that. Um, the the childcare subsidy was probably more closely modeled on the, uh, the New Hope um, health insurance. Uh, I'm sorry, childcare subsidy. Um, you know, the fact that New Hope was there, I think, was more important than what New Hope's impacts were. Um, so you know, people knew about New Hope, and, uh, uh, and the, the two-year results uh, helped kind of put New Hope on the map. Um, so everyone knew it was a set of you know, work-related supports that made sense. So as the legislative process proceeded, uh, they, they turned to New Hope for a possible model. Yep. One last question. Yeah, one last question. Uh, I just want to ask a question about the calculation of the wage supplement. Yeah, it, it, it was a very, <laughs> Rob Hollister spent a long time trying to uh, work this out. Um, and they wanted to make sure that the marginal tax rates uh, were never higher than 80%. That was the, the goal. And with the, um, the phase out of the subsidies, that proved very, uh, very difficult. But it was the uh, it was the cash income that they wanted to bring above the poverty line, and the the value of things like childcare benefits would be on top of that. So conceivably, uh, some of the families with a couple of kids taking up the childcare benefit could be substantially above the poverty line. Right. I think we should take a break. People who want to talk more with Greg will be here. And I, is there a session outside? So thank you, Greg.